That was beautiful, Tash. I want to spend some time in prayer because I feel like this is a chance for us to respond to that, to that moment of worship. Um, will you bow your heads with me? Mm-hmm. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the pertinent message of Tasha's story and of her song. And I pray that you help us to learn from it, to, to draw strength from it, to know that in every difficult and dark time, there is a song on the other side of it. And I'm sure there is many here that have come tonight that are just thinking of their own difficult battles that they need to smash down. And Lord, thank you that you will hold each of us by the hand and guide us. As we wrestle with uh, another um, topic tonight, may we grow from it. May we draw closer to you as a result. And may we uh, wrestle with these ideas, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I felt like for a moment also there we stepped into a a Disney movie with that voice. I just... uh, you know, it's, it was beautiful. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very amazing that you're giving your talent back to God, Tash. Inconceivable. Does anybody get that reference? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Yes, I, uh, I've had a lot of sermon titles in my time, but this one I feel is my favorite. Inconceivable. When something is inconceivable, it's something you could never imagine. It's just not on the radar. It's completely inconceivable, right? <laughs> so, is there anything you could uh, uh, think about that in your Christian journey has just been a real challenge? Um, for those of you who come here with a lot of experience, I'm talking to you, a lot of Christian, um, you know, coming to church or going to big camps, is there anything that comes to your mind that is challenging and in your journey with God? If it is, then I want you to recognize that for a lot of people who hear about Christianity, they recognize that too. And I think sometimes we need to be a bit more comfortable in recognizing that there are challenging things about the Christian journey. Tonight we're going to talk about one of those. And if you have already come to believe it because of your parents, I want to recommend to you that you give it another uh, reflection and to think about this important topic with me. We've spent a few nights uh, discussing a few different topics. We looked first at whether faith in the Christian faith is actually an option worth considering. We looked at whether it is believable. It Does it work? Does it matter? And I suggest that it does. The, the impact that it has on people throughout history and people in my own life and myself included, it has a significant impact. Um, we also looked at how the Bible is part of this journey. Does it, does it matter? Does it make a difference? I think it does. And if we explore it, we can, uh, we can discover some something that is very important that we all yearn for, happiness and flourishing. We looked at that last night. But tonight, I want to get to really what is the core of being a Christian. When we talk about the name Jesus, we will immediately run into a challenge. If I say the name of Jesus at my workplace, and I heard the name of Jesus often at the KFC I worked at for five years, because someone would drop something and call on his name, Jesus! Someone would, uh, someone would fall over and call on his name, Jesus. Of course, there was a few swear words afterwards, but let's leave that to the side, right? But in our culture, Jesus is, uh, is kind of this, this, this ghost, this memory, this, someone who was there once that was very significant, but now is dropping to um, the side, someone irrelevant. People wear crosses, churches have crosses on their buildings, but if you ask the average Australian what that meant, I can assure you, they would have no clue. Can I have my first slide up, please, and we'll start the journey. I want to tell you about a story of a man by the name of Mara Bar Serapion. Mara Bar Serapion. I don't think that's my first slide. If we can, yeah, that's the one. Mara Bar Serapion. He is a Syrian who was captured by the Romans in the year 70 AD. In the year 70 AD, the Romans were doing a conquest throughout the Middle East and making their way back to Europe where they would uh, showcase a lot of the, the people that they had conquered. Now, it is true that men think about the fall of the Roman Empire at least once a day. And I'm just reminding you men that this is maybe your chance if you haven't had the chance yet. But I, I think about it every single day. And this is uh, an example of someone who was yearning for the fall of the Roman Empire in his life. He was one of the conquered. He was one of the people that were taken. He was from Syria... And he writes a letter to his son. Now, if you were to be someone conquered and carried away from your hometown, and you were writing a letter to your children, you would want to write something of encouragement. And that's exactly what Mara did. 
Mara wanted to write to his son an encouraging letter, and he writes a lot of wisdom in it. You know, this is maybe the last time he'll get to speak to his kid. Think about that moment. Speaking for the last time to the people that you love. Mara writes a letter, and this is a fragment from this letter. And what's fascinating about this is it's very clear that this man has no Jewish experience. He is not connected to the Jews personally. He knows who they are because, you know, who doesn't know who a Jew is? Um, He isn't a Christian because Christians are still a very fledgling community. They're not as they are now. He is just a pagan. He alludes to it often. He talks about the gods and all this sort of thing. And he writes this little excerpt which fascinates historians and fascinates me. Now, a little bit about me before I read this is I'm a bit of a, well, I'm a big nerd, right? David stole my, um, my bio from my Victoria trip, which was actually intended for juniors and so now is for you youth, but that's why it has the reference to Lego there. Um, I, but now I think about it, I think Lego is appealing to all of us. Um, but whether it's, uh, whether it's turning on my PlayStation or whether it's building Lego, I'm a nerd through and through. I'm a nerd from start to finish. Um, and books, you name it, I'll be excited to read it. So if it's nerdy, I love it. And I love history. So if the book is thick and fat, you know you're on something good. That's just my experience. Now, what's, uh, what's interesting is as I spent time exploring history, and it's something I'm doing in my further study, there is a lot of interesting references to Jesus throughout the uh, ancient world. And this one is considered one of the most fascinating by historians because it's not written by someone who you would think would reference him. He says this, What advantage did the Jews gain from executing their wise king? Now, it's a bit of a clue that this is not a Christian, because he just calls him a king. He doesn't call him the son of God. He doesn't call him Christ. It's, he doesn't even name him Jesus. He just calls him the wise king. It was just after their kingdom was abolished, God justly avenged these three wise men. The Athenians died of hunger, the Samians were overwhelmed by the sea, and the Jews, desolate and driven from their own kingdom, live in complete dispersion. He's watched their city get destroyed, and just like his own. But Socrates is not dead because of Plato. He lives on in his disciple. Uh, neither is Pythagoras because of the statue, the statue of Juno. So you can go and see the statue of Juno, of which Pythagoras was highly influential in its, in its setting up. Nor is the wise king, now this is the bit that's important, nor is the wise king because of the new law he laid down. Historians listen to Mara Basarapian and recognize that he is talking about a king that was executed just before the destruction of Jerusalem and who set up a new way of living. Now, he doesn't mention the name of Jesus, but for us who are listening, we can see that this, is, this person is clearly talking about Jesus. And what the fascinating thing is, this is, is he is a pagan. But there's a question that it brings me to. Why are they still talking about this Jesus? Why are they still talking about this king that got executed 40 years after he died? When people get killed or when people die, they drop off the radar. Maybe for a little while you'll have people talking about them. But as we're going to discover, the the message of Jesus and, and the teachings of Jesus didn't just die out and fizzle out with him. It wasn't just passed on to... Uh, his disciple, like say Socrates, would pass on his teachings onto Plato. And so I want to show you two more people that write about Jesus around the same time. Now from the Roman perspective. So if we go to Suetonius next, Suetonius wrote uh, a lot and he wrote in one particular time in what is known as the Lives of the Caesars, particularly talking about Nero. Um, so he writes 69 AD, he writes this, Punishment was inflicted on the Christians, a class of men given to a new and mischievous superstition. The fascinating thing about this word superstition is that it actually implies like magic, like black magic. They, they couldn't really conceptualize what these Christians were about, but they, they thought they had to be doing something really odd and strange. It must be magic. It makes you laugh considering like when we think about magic as maybe filled in the books of Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, right? But to them, they couldn't, con- couldn't understand what they were about. Well, but what was new about it? What was strange and confronting and mischievous? Wouldn't it be cool to name your church the mischievous Seventh-day Adventist Church of Hobart? <laughs> I, just, I, I just would love to see what happens if there's a news article written about it. Let's go to one more person, another Roman. His name is Tacitus. 
Um, he writes his, uh, the histories, uh, the annals of history they're referred to, and it, he writes this, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus. And a most, there it is again, mischievous superstition, and a, uh, thus checked for the moment, again broke out. Like a bad case of acne, that every time you pop the pimple and think it's gone, three other pimples just come back out. They were so infuriated by this, that often these high-ranking Roman officials would write about it to each other and think of strategies on how to get rid of them. There was something really annoying and really strange about this new movement. But why were they still talking about it years later? That's the key thing. Why did they keep talking about Jesus? If He's dead, or if He never existed, why is there a bunch of people talking about Him Why is there a bunch of people concerned about this group of Christians who are Romans, who are very, very intelligent people and writing about it to each other? So what happened that was so mischievous, so magical? We're going to just explore that a little bit tonight because last night we spoke about the teachings of Jesus as having a real impact on your life and can actually make you happier, can actually bring more flourishing But that is not the thing that was mischievous and superstitious about Christians. Jesus taught lots of amazing things. And you could talk to the average Australian and they would say, that's pretty good. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do good to others. Do not judge. The average Australian would go, yeah. And your average Roman would be the same. Your average Jew would agree. Everyone would say, yeah, beautiful teachings. We should have that. But there was something that was confronting and downright offensive. That's what we're going to look at. When we talk about Jesus, it is the resurrection that is the most confronting thing for people. Why did the disciples believe that they saw Jesus rise from the dead? Why would any normal, sane person walk around saying, hey, I just saw Jesus back from the dead? Recently, I had the privilege and the weight of doing my first funeral in ministry. I had gone seven years without doing a funeral. And the first funeral that I ever did was the funeral of a mother at my school. Now, this is what made it the most heavy burden of my life to this point. Jess was driving to work in the morning when a man was chasing down his girlfriend who was running away from him. And she had got into the car of one Tony Bishop who was going home from a, uh, from a wedding. So he was coming home late. It was about three in the morning. And he saw this woman distressed running on the road. So he picked her up. This man who had stolen a car and was chasing down his girlfriend found Tony Bishop and, uh, and his girlfriend and started ramming the car. The man came onto the other side of the road and then had a head-on collision with Jess, killing Tony, the girlfriend, and Jess. And the man, he got away. He he walked away from the scene and took off. This person, it was my responsibility to care for the family and to do the funeral for them. It was the most challenging time. Imagine what that experience would be like losing your mum, losing someone so close to you. And if it is something that you've experienced, you know that pain. In that moment, there were so many uh, discussions and, you know, so many questions and And it was interesting watching Troy, the the surviving husband, talk to me about the grief and and even spoke to me in these terms. He said, you know, Jess, she's looking down on me from above. She's, she's, I can feel her. In times, he even described it as uh, she would embrace him. She could feel her. But it's fascinating to me that today, the average Australian would never dream of saying, I saw my loved ones come back to me. Are you with me? I've, I've seen people uh, go through grief, but never do they ever tell me that they are back from the grave. They may tell me how they can sense their presence, or they may think that they're looking down from above, but never physically did they see them with their own two eyes. This is not something that we say, do we? We don't, we don't really believe in zombies, 
Um, that's for The Walking Dead or, right, or, so, or some, some movie or TV show, but it's not a reality. When we talk about someone coming back from the dead, we would naturally conclude a few things. If I came to you and said, I saw my best friend come back from the grave, you would conclude that maybe I was confused, maybe I was dealing with it in that particular way, that I was maybe hallucinating, but you would never, ever, ever come to the conclusion that a person had truly come back from the grave. So why is all the writings that talk about Jesus, and we saw that some of them are, are very ancient, these are not written uh, hundreds of years later, but within living memory of the time when Jesus was there, why did they all insist that this must be the case? Now historians, and uh, I want to show you an uh, equation that we're working with, historians talk about there being some necessary conditions, that is things had to be the way they were, for there to result in a community of people called the church, a community of people that all believe something. If I came to you and I said, UFOs exist, I saw it, believe me, chances are I would maybe convince one of you. But if we all came together and you walked in and you were the only one and we all said, UFOs exist, you'd maybe question why you came that night, well, <laughs> and you'd definitely be ready to leave, right? But here's the key thing. These people, and a variety of different people, as we will see, were insistent that they had seen Jesus come back from the grave. Now, let's just work on this assumption. If that was all that we had, so here it is, appearances of Jesus. So they saw the appearance of Jesus, but there was a tomb to which they could go to where the body was still present. You would not come to the conclusion, naturally, that there was a resurrection, we wouldn't jump to that conclusion straight away, and we wouldn't all do that. Instead, we would say maybe that you're hallucinating, and once we bring the body to you, the hallucinations would fade. There's a term in psychology, which you might have heard of, which is called cognitive dissonance. This is a common thing that happens when we suffer greatly, that we want to make reality true, so we start to, so we start to make it in our mind. We know it to be so true. And so, a common uh, suggestion or a common uh, explanation for why the church started saying this was that they were suffering with cognitive dissonance. You might remember from Saturday night, if you were here, that I dropped out of high school and I stopped attending Browns Plains High just one day. But then I really had a desire a couple years later to become a pastor, so that required a bit of extra education. So, I started attending a TAFE in Kingston, it's Kingston Adult Education, and I started doing the course there. And when they found out that I was interested in Jesus, they had a field show. They were so excited that there was this person that believed in Jesus. There was a group of four of these guys that just peppered me with questions. I'll admit, when they asked me the questions, I had no idea what they were talking about because I didn't even know what cognitive dissonance meant. I didn't understand any of what they were saying. And these very intelligent people set me on a trajectory and started getting me to thinking about all these topics. And you may feel the same in your life. You may get challenges from people and you start to get asked these kind of questions. I want to encourage you that confusion and challenge should not mean that you need to throw it out. Just because it doesn't make sense, we don't just stop and pull back. Imagine if, if people thought of that way uh, when it came to inventing important technologies. We can't understand it, therefore we'll run away from it. We might not have the things that we have around us, like iPhones, cars, uh, airplanes, you name it. So the first followers of Jesus, there's something very interesting that happens here. They see, the, they see Jesus come, but none of them ever say, oh, you're back. Welcome back. Come on in. How was death? Was it good? Did you have a good time? Like, what was it like? Did you see the angels? Oh, you know, like, instead, all of them are absolutely and totally gobsmacked, confused, and a lot of them in denial. Are you serious? Like, you, when, when what, some of the disciples start to explain it to the others, they go, are you for real? You must have hit your head on the way in or something, right? But you did not see Jesus. Now, another common uh, response that I was given, and these are actually some that I received <laughs> over 10 years ago, was a concept called folie a deux. Has anyone heard of folie a deux? Okay, it's French, and it basically means this, madness of two. It also rhymes. If we can go to the next one, next one, I want to show you a picture of, of two people. 
You may not have seen these people. You may remember this story. This is an Australian family um, from Victoria. Some strange things happen in Victoria, I hear. <laughs> this is the Trump family. Now, the Trump family one day suddenly took off from their home. Two, uh, the mum and dad and three adult children. They took off, they left and they left all their belongings in their house. The doors left wide open, passports, uh, credit cards, everything. They didn't take anything with them. They just jumped in the car, and they drove off. And they drove, and they drove, and they drove. People got concerned because they'd come around the house, and they were gone, and everything was laying as it was. It was like they vanished. But this is where things got really, really weird. Not long after, and police started getting involved in this, they one by one started returning home until uh, the whole family just came back. And the fascinating thing is when they started to describe what, uh, what happened, none of them could piece together what had happened those, those, uh, those I think it was something like uh, 14 days or 15 days that they, were, that they were gone. This is what, you know, it kind of created this weird new sensation for 15 seconds uh, and everybody was trying to figure out what it was about. Does anybody remember this story? Okay, getting a few. Probably our Victorians, uh, or maybe it came down to Tasmania. Now, what was interesting was that people were trying to piece together what what happened. And they're a farming family, so maybe there was some sort of chemicals that kind of triggered all this. Um, Or maybe they were smoking something a little bit extra. I don't know, right? But, But the interesting thing is that they all shared this similar conclusion, that there was some sort of people after them. Very similar narrative, and they all needed to run away. So psychologists have kind of said, ah, oh, this, this might be a case of folly of Jew. And, ha- and what that means is that people share the same delusion. They share the same uh, delusion of what's been happening. Maybe it's, maybe it's aliens chasing after them or, or the CIA coming after them, and they share the exact same delusion. And the interesting thing is, you can, this, is this is how it often happens. Because it's called madness of two, it very rarely exceeds a large group. The max it could reach in this case was five. And the reason that was the case is because this was a very tight-knit family. They were very close, they lived together, and they spent a lot of time with each other. But here's the interesting thing. Folly of Jew breaks down really quickly when we start to have lots and lots of people involved. And so some people have suggested, well, the reason why people said Jesus was back from the dead is because they were all sharing a hallucination, which does happen. But the problem is a hallucination of, of that magnitude is impossible and never been seen before. There is no empirical evidence to the fact that there was a folly of Jew that could impact. Now, this is the interesting thing. The New Testament writers say that there were about 500 people who saw Jesus alive on the third day and over the subsequent weeks that he appeared to them. 500 people. Now, somebody in that group would have said, guys, what have you been smoking? Clearly, Jesus is dead. Stop talking about him coming back from the grave. But no, they all insisted on this very thing and generations later continued to say it. The Trump family, they don't, they, they're like 15 seconds. or 2016 and they're gone. They haven't created a, a massive sensation or a movement that's taken over the world. So it just doesn't quite answer the question, right? Why would people still be talking about Jesus? So historians go to another place. We'll go to the next slide. Suppose then, and you might remember this from David's um, Sabbath school discussion on Saturday morning, talking about the empty tomb being a hoax. Suppose we had an empty tomb, so people came to this place where they said Jesus was and it was empty, it was hollow, but no one had seen Jesus. Again, that wouldn't really just jump to the conclusion, oh, raised from the dead. (laughs) That's a very clear conclusion. Empty tomb, man's come back to the grave, let's all worship him and die for him. Instead, you would probably question it and say, maybe you put in the wrong, maybe you went to the wrong tomb, maybe you, uh, you got confused, but you wouldn't conclude resurrection. But it does point to one little detail. The fact that everybody spoke about an empty tomb, and interestingly, even opposition has said maybe that, or accused them of stealing the body, tells you that there was such a thing as a tomb that was empty on the third day. There was a hollow place where they had laid Jesus, which was now empty. So, this is where we get to in the equation. This is the important part here, and I want you to zero in here. If you've checked out, I'd like you to lean back in, because this is important. The empty tomb and the appearances of Jesus is what led to a new belief. 
There's a concept called double dissimilarity in, in historical studies, which in essence means this. If something didn't happen before the event and something didn't happen after the event, so it wasn't borrowing from another story or we don't see it elsewhere, something unique has happened in this moment. And scholars and historians look at this and say there is an empty tomb and there were people saying that there are appearances of Jesus, which led to a new way of understanding things. It wasn't the same old. It was something very, very different. Because, again, remember, if it was just the appearances, you're hallucinating. If it's just the empty tomb, you might be mistaken. But as the two came together, it led to a new condition or a new outcome, which led to a very, very interesting 2,000 years between now and then. See, what we're actually looking at is when historians pick up these uh, ancient texts of the Gospels, they actually look at them and say, there is something, um, there's something different about this. It's not like the, the, the um, Iliad where Zeus comes back every season or, or it's not like Baal which would die and resurrect. It was something completely different. These people actually believed that Jesus came back from the dead. And then they went on and told people about it. And then they even went on to die for it. Now, I have often heard people ask me the question, well, how do you know that this wasn't just Chinese whispers or it was just a case of, you know, they kind of got confused uh, over time. The story grew from, from myth to legend. Well, if we can go to the next slide or maybe jump to, I want to give you this scenario. Imagine you ordered a pizza, and I love pizza. I don't know about you, but I could go for one right now. Yeah. Pizza is something delicious. Now, imagine you've got a pizza and, uh, you know, they came to the door, ding, you open the door and there's the pizza standing there and you just notice a little bit of, a, a little bit of grease around, around the man's mouth that's coming to give you a pizza. Maybe it's kind of soaking through his mask. I don't know why this guy's a mask still. It's not COVID anymore. But uh, <laughs> you notice that uh, he's handing it to you, he's ready to leave and you go, you just want to check it. So you open it up and, uh, and inside there's just a piece missing, Right? Wouldn't you have some questions? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, 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 the purpose of the delivery driver is not to have a, a quick snack of your meal and to test it. That was what we used to do in our family. We'd take a bite and I passed to my sister. I was just, just checking that it wasn't poisoned, right? Like, here you go. It is. You're, you're welcome. I'm, I'm doing you a service, right? In the reality, when we talk about delivering something to someone, we want to get it the way that it was originally made and we want it in the condition that it was intended to be. Otherwise, we're going to make complaints. And this is the fascinating thing. Throughout ancient time, as well as modern, we've always wanted the facts as they happened. It's not a case of, you know, they call this chronological snobbery. It's not the case that we Australians, we, we're the, the thinkers. And those people back then, those Romans and Greeks, they were a bunch of fools. They're a bunch of silly billies. They think of, you know, that the fairies inhabit the trees and that's why it works like that. It wasn't that case. They told stories like that, but so do we, right? We talk about Marvel and we talk about Lord of the Rings. We don't actually believe them to be the case. But when they thought of something valuable, they would want to pass it on. If I can go to the next slide, please. So what I want to share with you is something very interesting. As we go through the New Testament and historians, they often use this word, delivered. And you can see it here in 1 Corinthians 15. This is one of the very early letters, considered to be something like 20 years uh, maybe even less after the resurrection of Jesus, Paul, one of, uh, or rather, sorry, yeah, 50, I'm doing my math right, it's about actually 16 years if we're being serious. So it says this, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. What do you hear there? Do you hear Paul coming up and saying, I want to make up my own little religion. I want to make up my own slice of this. I want to, I want to have my own twist on the story. Or do you see him saying, I heard about this, and this is the fascinating thing. One of the, person, one of the people that write the most about the New Testament were, wasn't actually there when Jesus rose from the dead. Instead, he is very committed to saying, I need to tell you what other people saw, just like I'm doing with you right now. And I don't want you to think I took a slice of the pizza or added my own little toppings on top. And so he says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day. He actually died. Islam suggests that uh, Jesus didn't actually die and that he resuscitated on the third day. But what we actually see is 
the, the earliest um, uh, testimonies or the earliest traditions said that he was dead. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared to me. And I think I have a little bit extra here. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, later on, another person who didn't see Jesus had the same methodology. He said, many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were, what's that word there? Eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It's a, it's a sad reality that there, since 1946, since the end of the Second World War, that there have been people that have suggested that there is no such thing as the Holocaust. It has actually been a common refrain, and one Bertoche, a French uh, scholar, suggested the year after the end of the war that it was all a ruse of the Allies saying that the, the Holocaust was not a real event. How do we actually verify that such a thing happened? Because here's the sad reality. For those of you who spend some time studying World War II history and, and learning about the Holocaust, it, the, the Nazis were very, very talented and meticulous. They knew how to kill a person and to get, make sure they never existed. There are places all over Poland that were camps where, you know, now we, this, the number is suggested to be millions of people were taken to gas chambers, killed and incinerated. So how do we actually know this event happened when all the physical evidence is gone? Well, the fascinating thing is that often historians and scholars have responded, and how they do this is by looking at texts. They look at uh, the writings of the people that were there, and there's some sad, sad stories that you can um, unpiece. I know one letter said, Mummy, I've missed you. When are you coming home? That is all it said. A letter from a child which was... 12 years old, to his mother, written in Polish. We don't know what happened to the boy or the mother, but many many letters are found. You can actually Google letters of the Holocaust and the website will show you all of these letters. But these are the only access points that we actually have to those people. We have a few records that the commandants kept. We also have circumstantial evidence. You can actually see a serious drop in the world population of Jews in the years of the war, especially towards the end. But we don't have anything beyond that. All we have is the eyewitness testimony. The people who went through those uh, camps, the people who experienced those challenges and then who wrote about it, or they are some of them still alive today. It's the same with with the, the resurrection of Jesus. We can't go and say, here's Jesus, he's standing right here, right? But we can say that people experienced and saw him and wrote about it and wrote extensively about it. I've only given you a snippet, but there are 50, 50 extra biblical authors who are Roman, Jewish, Syrian, who didn't call themselves Christians, who wrote about Jesus in some way or his followers in the early parts of the first and second century. Now, another thing that has often been said to me is that over time, you know, maybe it Maybe they just mistook the details. Maybe they got mixed up. But I imagine there's some of you who are alive when this event happened. Raise your hand if you were alive when this when this happened. You know, when I, when it happened for me, well, when I when I uh, when I was waking up I, in the morning, I was in grade four at the time, and I remember going to turn on Cheese TV. Don't know if anyone watched Cheese TV. Yeah, good times. I was ready to watch some Pokemon, some Dragon Ball Z, and some Yu-Gi-Oh. You know, that's what you do when you're in grade four. Yeah? Are you with me? Yep. Anyone else? Yes. I'm getting some nods. Okay. For the rest of you, you're probably like, um, I don't know, I want Roblox or something, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so this is what I was getting excited about that morning. But when I turned on the TV, that wasn't what I saw. <laughs> this is what I actually saw. I saw the towers and the planes, and I thought it was some sort of TV show. But then it played all day, and I started realizing, oh, this is not... This is not uh, a TV show. This is, this is news. This is real. Um, and then when the towers fell... Now, the interesting thing for all of us is that we will remember the details of that day if we were there. I wasn't even present 
but I watched it through the TV, but I can still remember it. Like, I can remember the TV box. I can remember sitting in the lounge room, what the lounge room looked like. It, like, it was like a snapshot moment for me. It was a very, sh- a very surreal moment. This is 20 years, roughly, from the time when that happened. About the same distance between the resurrection and the first writing of the gospel, and the writing of that letter that we just read from, uh, from Paul. The interesting and very important thing I want to point out to you is that even though we might not remember every single detail that happened on September 11, 2001, we can remember that one plane flew into the first World Trade Center. Correct me if I ever stray from the fact. Then a second one, and then one fell, and then the second fell. Is that pretty accurate to the events? And what was that? Okay, you even remember key details like 824, right? And that's 20 plus years ago. This, often the sad reality is people say that Christians, when they talk about this, that they base it on fairy tales and, and wishful thinking, wish fulfill, fulfillment. But what the early believers, and that's who I'm relying on here, not on Jacob, the early believers, they saw this, they experienced it, and then they told people about it. It impacted them so much. It was a life-changing event. To see someone come back from the grave is not a common thing. It was a earth-shattering event. If we can go to the next slide, please. And this is somebody who was uh, not even connected to it, but he writes in a similar way about this desire to keep a written record. Uh, this is a man by the name of Flavius Josephus. He was a Jew that got captured in the destruction of Jerusalem, a similar event to the, the destruction of the World Trade Centers of the time. Lots of people wrote about it. It was horrific. And he says this, I kept a written, record, re- a written record of all that went on under my eyes in the Roman camp and was alone in a position to understand the information brought by deserters. So he's watching the people coming in. He's writing down their stories. If I go to the next slide, please. He goes on to say this, then in a, le- in a leisure which Rome afforded me, basically he said to them, all hail Rome, you know, down with the Jews, I'm with the empire. They said, right, you can live, you can, write down, uh, you can write down stuff for us. So with all my materials in readiness, at last I committed to writing my narrative of events. Now I've highlighted it and given it to you in Greek, but it's the same word that Luke used, it's the same word that Paul used. <laughs> what these people were doing were writing down real events. And it was so important to them that they had to set it down in writing and pass it on to the next generation, pass it on to the next generation, and to make sure that everybody understood when Mary came to the tomb that morning, if I can go to the next slide, please. When Mary came to the tomb that morning in John 20, verses 14 to 17, you can read along with me if you'd like to read the story. It said that, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know that it was Jesus standing there. She came to the tomb. I think I can go one more slide, please. When she came to the tomb, she was expecting to come there to, to check the tomb out because her her master, her teacher, had just been killed two days before. Mary had come with the disciple, uh, with another disciple, with Peter, to, to check over the body, to look after it, to make sure that everything was okay. I know personally, watching my lo- someone I love with their life uh, ended, it's something that is so difficult to, to, to gather and to work through. When my dear friend James, when we were studying in college, passed away, everything just froze. He was studying to be a pastor like me. He was a couple years older than me, and in the night he had an epileptic seizure. He fell out of his bed, and that was it. I was one of the pallbearers carrying him from the front of the church to the car and then from the car to the, to the grave. And I, I know the feeling of what it's like to say goodbye to someone you love, and I'm sure you do too. And when you get to that point, all you can think about is, the, the past and what you're thinking of, of how much you love them and, and you, you got your questions. No doubt Mary had that same, those same hurts and pains when she came to that tomb on that morning. And somebody says to her, why are you weeping? What are you looking for? If that was me, I would be very frustrated because I, I get very emotional and, and I can think when when I was going through the difficult time, it seemed like no one could understand what I was going through. It was like a grey cloud was over me. Everything was in black and white. The only person that was really there for me was my best mate, Marche. The two of us, we just looked out for each other and we just cried in our, in our dorm room in Watson Hall at Avondale just 
for the for the weeks that led up to the end of the ter- uh, to the end of the break um, semester. So people coming up to ask me, I'd be frustrated. She, and if you'd like to follow along with me, John twenty verses fourteen to 17, seventeen it says, supposing him to be a gardener, said to him, "Sir, if you've carried him away, please tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away." I read that with frustration. I, I just I hear her voice and I say, "Like, why are you mucking around with his body? Just leave him alone. Let me just grieve, please." But what she didn't realize is who she's talking to. That's cognitive dissonance. She's standing before Jesus. She can't even fathom that that he would be standing there. That's what's so real about the first eyewitness testimonies of Jesus. They all couldn't just see him right before before them. She had to think he was a gardener. And Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. At that moment, she turned to him and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, or teacher. And Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me. I haven't gone back to my father, but soon I will be back. And at that moment, he said her name. And that was enough for her to snap out of that, that dark cloud that she had fallen under. She had gone there thinking that she would find what she was looking for. But she didn't realize that someone was looking for her. This is the beautiful story of the resurrection, that someone has conquered the grave. And there's a historian that asks this very serious and important question, which is on the screen now. If it happened, then it matters. If it happened, does it matter? If the World Trade Centers fell, did it matter? Yes, it meant so much and it's changed the whole world. We don't any longer walk through airports the same way. We don't think about flying the same way. If something happens in history, it changes the future. And if somebody got up from the grave, truly, physically, returned from the grave, then I want to know about that. I want to know about someone who has defeated death, who has overcome death, not just resuscitation, but truly and totally resurrected back from the dead. Not just people hallucinating, but truly, fully back from the dead. This is something beautiful. This is something that matters. When Thomas encountered Jesus, for those of you in the room who know, how did he respond? Thomas doubted until he said, let me touch him. Let me, let me, like, let, there's holes in his hands and in his sides. I must touch them. But what I want you to recognize here is it's not a strange story of someone just trying to physically touch him, but Jesus is willing to recognize that if you're doubting, you're not out. There's still a place for you. If you're trying to figure things out and you're wrestling, then get in line. Every single follower of Jesus had questions that morning. Jesus, what the, like, how are you back? They all were in denial. They were all confused. And it even says they were all scared. If you walk into your Christian journey and you're trying to figure out where's God working, where is he at right now, then let me assure you that there is room for you. If you've seen some terrible things happen in church and you're wondering, how could God allow church members to act like that? Then there is still room for you. Today, I found out news that the possible home that would be mine has been, I've been rejected from it. One month of an attempt to get a house swept out in the space of a one-minute phone call from the bank. And I don't even understand it. It doesn't even make sense to me. Everything was ticks until now. But I've had to wrestle with that and recognize, God, you're at work here. I don't see what's going on, but if you could conquer the grave, then whatever this is, it's up to you. It is up to you. And you know what? For me, if, if he has dealt with death, that means life has a purpose. Life matters. That was changed the way that I care about the poor person on the street who has no money. It'll care about the person that I hate with all my guts. I will show them the love of God because the love of God is even more powerful than hatred and death. And if it's calling me to some challenging, difficult uh, obstacle ahead of me, I know that even the greatest giant of death and sin has been conquered by Jesus. That's why I think someone like Martin Luther King Jr., who endured such racism and such segregation in his time, could say that the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. What did he mean by that? He said that even though there's all this difficult stuff happening around us, 
that the end goal, the end, the end of the story is victory. How did he know? How did he have the audacity to say that? Because he was following Jesus. Martin Luther King Jr. was a disciple of the one who died and rose again. I could tell you of hundreds of stories of people that have changed this world because of the fact that they knew that Jesus was alive again. I want to sing with you. I want to sing with you. Come up, band. Let's sing together. I want to invite each of you to recognize for yourself that the central belief, the central focus of being a Christian is not about how much I do, but about what He did. Jesus is risen from the dead. That's more important than anything you could offer Him. So now is your invitation to step into that and to realize that and to live in it. Will you sing with us? Let's sing together.